Good evening, listeners. The time is 9pm and the moon is beautiful on this cold night. You are listening to The Phantom Myth with me, your host, Priscilla Phantom. Listeners, I find that I have to start this broadcast off with some rather troubling news. You likely have already heard of this news, or part of it at least. Do you remember the young woman from my second episode? We changed their names to protect their identities, referring to them as Kira and Beatrix. Kira claimed that her roommate had been possessed by a demon and that she had started singing about wanting to kill her. Now Kira managed to escape from the flat, shaken but unharmed, and Beatrix had been arrested shortly after. Well, I have ascertained from an anonymous source that the reason that she had been arrested was that she was suspected of murder. Maybe suspected is a generous term. She was found standing over the body of a man, holding a murder weapon, a croquet mallet. It was apparently covered in blood. My source said she didn't try to fight the police, and she went willingly. But she did not stop laughing until she was in the car. Since then, she has refused to answer any questions put to her. However, the most disturbing news of all comes from the fact that she escaped from jail this morning. During her escape, she killed two police officers and injured five more. I have been authorised to tell you her real name, but if you have heard the news today, you have probably already guessed it. Her name is, in fact, Edith Horn, although my source did tell me that she has taken to call herself Beatrix after she heard my broadcast. It looks like I have a new fan. (laughs) I'm not going to lie to you, dear listeners. I am both flattered and terrified. She is a highly dangerous individual, and I do not like being on her radar at all. I do not know how she feels about me, all my broadcasts, but I don't like that she is aware of them. Please, if you see her, do not approach her. Get somewhere safe and phone the police. The police are doing everything they can to apprehend her, but I would urge you all to lock your doors. Set any security alarms Keep your phones close and maybe keep a bat by your bed tonight. She is deluded and possibly armed. Now, in the light of this troubling news, I have decided that tonight doesn't seem like the kind of night for ghost stories. So instead, I'm going to open the phone lines for anybody who would like to call in to talk about the current situation or tell their own stories or just give feedback on the show. Okay, and the phone lines are open. So feel free to... Oh, well, listeners, it looks like we already have a call. Good evening, listener. You are on the air. Hello, Scylla. (sighs) <sighs> Hello, Charlie. For those of you who don't know, this is my brother, Charlie. So, look, you keep telling people these supernatural occurrences aren't real. But you have to know by now... Now, have you had any recent supernatural experiences? Or do you have anything to say about Edith Horn? You know this isn't Edith Horn. We went to school with her. She was loud and annoying, but... She wasn't murderous. I don't know what you are talking about. Scylla, 
You've got to stop this. You're putting people in danger. I... Charlie. I... I need to go back to my show. Fine. I've got a story for you. I once knew a little girl who believed in monsters when nobody else did. Her father went away when she was young, leaving her mother, her brother and her. Stop it. She used to tell her family of the monsters she saw roaming in the woods or sneaking past her bedroom window in the dead of night. I told you to stop it. I'm not a little girl anymore, and I do not believe in monsters. The mother never believed the ridiculous stories of children, and her brother didn't see the eyes that watched them from the dark. And they were right. There were no monsters. Just a little girl with an overactive imagination. You know this stuff is real. You know what happened to Mum. I don't know what happened to Mum. No one knows. You were there! I don't remember. You do remember. You just don't want to face it. I can't blame you for that, but you know she would never have done that herself. <laughs> Listen to yourself. You sound ridiculous. I sound ridiculous. You sound like you're about to have tea with the king. We grew up in a council house, Scylla. Don't remind me. Look, you're desperately trying to explain things that cannot be explained. Things not of this world. Things that don't want to be explained. By their very nature, they defy explanation. A little bit overdramatic, don't you think, Charlie? You're not taking this seriously. Is there anything else you want to talk to me about? Or did you think that the middle of my broadcast was the perfect time to get into this argument again? <sighs> You're right. We should talk another time. But actually, there was something else. I ran into Mary Underwood this afternoon. Do you remember her? Yes. She's friends with Aunt Carol, isn't she? Yeah. She was talking to Reverend Sage about ghosts in her house. She said she had a message for you. What was it? I don't know. She said she sent you a letter and she was adamant that you had to read it right away. Oh. I think I remember seeing her name on an envelope. Ah, here it is. Look. My job's done, but please, just be nice to her. When am I not nice? You can be really mean. What about when you read Arthur Smith's letter? He tore into pieces. He stands in the middle of a park, constantly intoxicated, raving about the end of times. The man was claiming that blood was falling from the sky, a cult raised a demon in the fictitious basement of Milton's music shop, and that we were all about to die. He's not exactly credible. I'm not saying it was entirely accurate, but what if he did see something? He didn't. There are monsters out there, Scylla. You stop calling me that. My name is Priscilla, and if you have to shorten it, I like Pris. Okay, Priscilla. What was that, Charlie? I said, okay, Priscilla. Oh dear listeners, it seems Charlie got cut off somehow. <sighs> I will be reading out a letter from Mary Underwood. Dear Priscilla Phantom, It'll be nice to catch up with you, but as you've probably guessed, I'm writing to talk to you about something much more serious. I think the first thing that seemed strange started last Wednesday, or... Thursday. What day is Wednesday news night on? It was whenever that happened. Anyway, there was a problem with the TV. I know, I'm an old lady afraid of her own TV. You probably think I'm overreacting, and to be honest, I can't be sure that I'm not. All I could see was static. Whichever channel I went to. I know this doesn't seem scary and I certainly wasn't scared at the time. But I do think it was the first signs of what might be. A ghost? I don't know. But Carol tells me you're an expert. Anyway. I've never had this problem since I moved here. I got cable and 
Apparently that means the signal can't get mixed up. That's what the nice man who came out to have a look at it said. My husband, God rest his soul, used to sort out all kinds of stuff. The nice electrician man, Joe, I think his name was, said he couldn't see a problem with it and would need to call in some help. But when we plugged it all back in, it suddenly worked again. Then on Friday morning, my keys went missing. Well, not missing exactly. I found them eventually. Maud and Graham from next door are having a baby, so I wanted to drop off a cake. I went to leave and noticed my keys weren't on the little hook by the front door. I searched the entire house, but I couldn't see them anywhere. The only way out of the house that I could see was to climb out of the window. But as I'm sure you know, dear, I'm not as athletic as I once was. My arthritis is getting bad and there's no way I could have made it. In the end, I rang Maud on the landline and she came over with a spare key and helped me search the house. They were gone, or at least they weren't in the house. We gave up and she said she would let me have her key and she would borrow Amanda from across the road's key to make a spare. I thanked her and gave her the cake and some money to get the new key cut. However, as she went to leave, my keys were sitting on my doorstep as if I had put them through the letterbox. I don't remember doing so, and I can't think of a good reason why I would. I went back into the living room, and I found that I had left the TV on, although I could have sworn that I had turned it off. And it had gone static again, which seemed strange. I wandered over to the TV to turn it off, but the closer I got the more I noticed something beneath the white noise. A crackling, broken laugh. Somebody, something, was laughing. It didn't sound right. It didn't sound human. It was laughing at me through the TV. I know this sounds ridiculous. An 83-year-old woman who thinks the TV is laughing at her. But I swear that's what it sounded like. I pressed the little button on the side of the TV and the screen went black and the white noise stopped. But the laughing continued for a moment more. As if whoever was making the noise hadn't realised that they were supposed to stop. The giggle, a strange imitation of human joy, seemed to be coming from everywhere. And then it stopped. And honestly, I think I convinced myself that I had imagined it. I turned the TV back on and it started playing a soap opera. I've forgotten which one. It was a regular episode and everything seemed to be working fine. So I watched, and I tried to forget about my troubles. Nothing happened for a few days, and I put my problems and the TV down to some kind of issue with the cable company. I told myself that maybe I had started sleepwalking, and had posted the keys through the front door on my sleep. I didn't really have an answer for how the TV was laughing at me, except maybe a side effect of my medication or a dream. I think I just thought I was imagining it. Until I tried to leave my house this morning to meet your Aunt Carol at the little cafe in town with the pink teacup sign, I was thinking that I shouldn't be late as I was late the last time we met up and she was always kind enough to save me a seat every week at church. I was getting dressed in a blue skirt 
with a matching blouse that I got on sale from a magazine. I no longer twist very well, and while I struggled a bit to get my arm in the sleeves, I thought about Maud telling me I ought to get a carer to come and help me. She might be right, but I like my independence. I had just finished buttoning up my blouse when the lights went out. I thought I had somehow tripped the circuit breaker, so I went to turn the fuse back on, but as I passed the living room, something caught my eye. The TV turned itself on. It wasn't that I had left it on, somehow, but I swear to you, Priscilla, I actually saw the little red light turn green by itself. That horrible static came back to the TV and I could swear I heard a voice somewhere behind it. I don't know where it came from or what it was saying. Maybe it was some kind of new TV show that I don't understand, I don't know, but it scared me. Beneath the white noise was something, a voice and an inhuman laugh. When the lights switched themselves back on and the TV switched itself back off, and for a moment I thought everything was back to normal until I heard the sound of a note passing through the letterbox in the door and I glanced over. The door had an obscure window but it was light outside so I should have seen the shadow of a person on the other side of the door but there was no one. No movement at all. It was a still day and nobody was outside. I remember that clearly. I'm getting old and my memory isn't what it used to be. But I'm so certain of what I saw and what I did not see. And I did not know what to make of it. I went over to the door and pulled the slip of paper from the letterbox, which closed with a thump. My heart stammered for a moment, not from surprise, but just because the noise felt so final. I've never been so scared and I still don't know exactly what it was that scared me so much about the experience. The note was a slip of smooth white paper. It looked like a joke. You know the kind, like the awful jokes you get from inside a Christmas cracker. The piece of paper did not have a joke on it. Or, if it did, it wasn't a joke. I understood. It had been written with horrible spiky letters, and honestly, the penmanship was terrible. All it said was, Soon, Priscilla. I don't know what this means, but I thought I should tell you. You're the only Priscilla I know of on this island, so I'm sure the note was supposed to be for you. I just don't know why whoever it was would send it to me. Since that note, I have become less inclined to believe that I had imagined the things that I saw and heard. I am scared for myself and I am scared for you, Priscilla. Thank you for listening to an old woman's ramblings. I hope this means something to you and I hope that you can stay safe. <sighs> okay, this was... <laughs> it does seem likely 
that Edith Hall or Beatrix or whatever she is calling herself has been in Miss Underwood's home. Um, Harvey, would you please phone the police? Miss Underwood's contact information is on the envelope here. Thank you, Harvey. I will admit, I think she was right in thinking there has been a problem with the cable company and she had imagined the laughing in the static on the TV. It is also very possible that she heard the second episode of my show and combined the experiences in her mind. Memories are delicate and can be altered easily. This is true for anyone. Whatever your mental health or background, all of our memories can be corrupted by suggestion, leading questions and persuasion. And, as far as I can tell, in both cases the laughing has never been clear enough or loud enough for people to be certain that they heard it at all. She also mentioned that she was on medication. There are a few prescription drugs which are linked with hallucinations or, given her age, it could be a side effect of dementia. I think maybe it would be prudent to speak to a doctor about this. I am not a trained professional and I am sure listening to the sage advice of a medical practitioner would be far more illuminating than what I have to tell you. There was nothing supernatural here, and the TV was certainly not laughing at her. But it does seem that she may be in danger, not from some demonic creature of a ghostly presence, but from a disturbed young woman. It's just the note the slip of paper. It sounds a lot like the note I received and the one that Kira claimed to have found inside an old radio. Of course, at this time I have no definite evidence that this note exists, but it does concern me. Mary was right to say I am the only Priscilla on the island. The only Priscilla alive, anyway. The note was for me. I don't know why or what it means. Or why it would have to have been sent to Mary Underwood rather than myself. I hope I am wrong. But it feels like Beatrix is playing some sort of game. And I don't think I want to be involved in any capacity. And I hope that Mary Underwood is okay. In any case, I suggest that you all lock your doors, tuck your children in, set your alarms, and sleep with your phone under the pillow. If you hear a noise, an inhuman sounding laugh, or a thump in the dark. Hide and call for help. Tonight, there is something lurking in the darkness, but I am here to tell you, dear listeners, that something is human. She can be stopped and she will be apprehended. Soon, this island will be safe once more. But in the meantime, take care and look after one another. Sleep well. <laughs> the voice of Priscilla Phantom was Lindsay Evans. The voice of Charlie Phantom was Matt Hill. The voice of Beatrix, the demon, was myself, Sasha Williams. Thank you for listening to our podcast, The Phantom Myth. Hope you enjoyed it.
have a day, just a day that exists. Isn't that really all we can hope for? If you did enjoy this podcast, and most importantly, if you can afford to, you can, if you'd like, donate to the Phantom Myth PayPal page. There should be a link in the description. Thank you.